Nice to have you here this morning. Beautiful day. I'm excited. We're going to get into a four-week series on my namesake book, Daniel. And we're going to look at four stories out of a book that we could draw probably 20 stories. Um, but after spending several months, for those of you that have been around here for a while, we've looked at the life and work of Jesus through the Gospel of Luke. And I think now we should talk about how we live out that Christian faith. And I think there's... Uh, uh, as good a book on that, in, uh, good a teachings on that in the book of Daniel as there is anywhere. It's, let me give you a little background. The book of Daniel is, I love saying that name, is uh, one of the books, <laughs> is one of the books um, that talk about the time of exile, of Judah into Babylon, the some of the others are Esther, Ezekiel, parts of Jeremiah, which we'll actually get to look at this morning, and parts of some of the other prophets. But for those of you that, you know, I know history can bore, bore some people, maps and history just light me up. Um, let, let me just talk about, real quick here, the nation of Israel under King David and then his son, King Solomon, and the only king before them was King Saul, and prior to that, the nation of Israel was basically led by God and the prophets and the judges. But in this time of David, um, it was called the nation of Israel, but, uh, and then as well as under Solomon, and it thrived as a kingdom. But after Solomon passed on, the nation was divided. There were 12 tribes that originally took that land over, and 10 of the tribes in the north were known then as the nation of Israel. And the two tribes... Judah and Benjamin that were in the south were known as Judah. So when you hear that, you go, why do they call it Judah? Isn't it Israel? Yes, it is, but it was divided. And so after Israel was taken away by the Assyrian nation, those people were scattered never to come back as the nation of Israel again. You saw fragments of it in Jesus' day with the Samaritans. They were half-breeds, people that had intermixed a century and a half, well, five and a half centuries before, after the Assyrians had basically wiped out the northern kingdom. But the Assyrians weren't able to wipe out Judah. That's a great story in Hezekiah all unto itself. But anyway, so Judah is remaining, and like in, uh, starting in like uh, 605 B.C., the Babylonians started to rattle their sabers, and then, uh, and that was what happened. And Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, um, brought these exiles back into a culture that was hostile to God. Um, so the question that comes up for us today is, you know, how do I live as a believer in a society where all the um, cultural institutions are hostile to my faith? I don't know about you, but there's not a week that goes by that I'm not reading something today or hearing something or seeing something on the news or listening to a podcast where the hair, as it were, on my neck stands up and I go, what is happening to this culture? You know, a, a guy my age, man, we're just like blown out by it. You know, I tell all my friends as they complain about it, I go, this is no country for old men. And uh, it, it's just, it's a changing landscape, is it not? So Daniel is very relevant to us this morning. Now, what I'd like to do as I get into this is I want to give you a context to, I've got a lot of scripture I want to read here from the story today, but I've got to give you a little context going into the narrative, right? So King Nebuchadnezzar is the king over Babylon, and he has a dream, and he has all these wise men in his court, and uh, he goes to them, and instead of saying, interpret my dream, he tells them, I not only want you to interpret my dream, but you have to tell me what my dream is. And, of course, they all wig out and go, we can't do that. Nobody can do that. Nobody can tell you what you dream. And he's going, well, you guys are full of malarkey because I know whatever I tell you, you're going to come up with some interpretation and you're not going to have it right. So the only way I know you have it right is if you can interpret my dream. Well, Daniel, who has been drug off there with three of his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and probably 10,000 other people, they are part of these magi. They are part of these wise men, these enchanters. That's where they got placed in their intellect in Babylon, and they are part of the threat because the king says, if no one can come up with what my dream is and interpret it, you're all going to be killed, all right? So that's the context. And Daniel goes to his three buddies and says, pray for me because otherwise we're all going to be dead. And so he goes to the king and he says, 
uh, I, I need a little time, and the king grants him that time, and, and they pray. And that night, God reveals to Daniel what happens. And that's what we're going to read right now. God supernaturally gives Daniel Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's a fascinating story. It's in Daniel chapter 2. Let's dig in here together. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner, the people that I'm a part of, can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the reveler of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than any other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. And you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue. This was his dream. He's telling you it now. An enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Now, while you were watching this, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now I want you to drop down to verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will in itself endure forever. Amen, amen. amen. Verse 45, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. This is the word of the Lord. Now, clearly, Nebuchadnezzar didn't get what Daniel just said, did he? <laughs> He's bowing down before Daniel. Now, there, there are three questions that really arise from this story that I want to talk about this morning. What's the meaning of Daniel having these two names, Daniel and Belteshazzar? What's the meaning of the dream, and what's the rock that strikes the statue? And those answers, I think, will help me, as they have this week, in understanding how to follow Jesus in a culture that's going in an opposite direction from me. So let's look at the meaning uh, of the two names. Uh, right there, it says in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, that Daniel is a Hebrew for God is my judge, and Belteshazzar is Babylonian for Bel, that was their main god, is my god. Now, I, I told you, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a, this great king. He really took Babylon and put him on the map. And uh, they, they actually waned after his death. There were five kings that came after them before they ultimately uh, disappeared from the planet. Um, but he, he came in 587 B.C. and flattened Jerusalem. I mean, just destroyed it. Tore the wall down, tore the temple down, killed the people, and anyone that remained he brought back with them. Um, but what most people don't know is that Nebuchadnezzar actually came to Jerusalem twice. Ten years earlier, in 597 B.C., he, he came and defeated them, but he didn't destroy anything, right? He kind of raided the temple, and then he took 10,000 of the sharpest people in, in Israel and dragged them up to Babylon with him. But he left the nation and a puppet king in charge, right? And that puppet king and the people down there still didn't do what they were asked to do with their taxes and stuff, and so that's when he came back ten years later and smoked them. But the point was, he took the best and the brightest first 
before he came back and ultimately raised him to the ground. And, and he took these intellectually uh, sound people of Israel and tried to turn them culturally into Babylonians. And that's why you find two names. Now, Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet of God during this time. When they came in 597 and took these best and brightest away, Jeremiah remained there in Judah. And he wrote to those people that had been exiled, the first group, while Israel and or while Judah and Jerusalem still existed, he wrote a blueprint for how they should live while they're in Babylon. It is, it is perhaps the most fascinating piece of prophecy in Jeremiah's um, book. And it really was quite surprising when you look at the context. So I'd like to read this because it really applies to the second chapter of Daniel and why Daniel had two names and why he was able to function the way he was. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says to the exiles in Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pretty wild, huh? There's a lot in there, but I want to show you three things here quickly. Jeremiah says, it's part of God's plan that you lose your cultural power. Um, it was part of his plan for them to live as Jewish believers in a pagan culture. It's part of God's plan in America today for us to see the great transformation that's taking place in our culture. It's shocking for those of us that have any years on us, have been around the sun a few times, how much America has changed. Who would have ever thought that America in my life would be looking at a, a potential presidential candidate that's a socialist? Never! Things change, don't they? And here's what God says in Jeremiah 29, right after this, a passage you may be familiar with. Jeremiah writes right after he gives them the blueprint. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, and that's how much longer that nation lasted, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, back to Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 11, for I know, here's the verse you've heard before, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Those words are as every bit as true for you and I today in our culture. God's plan for them was to be humbled and to be weakened in their political power. It was part of his plan for them to lose that cultural power. That was first. Secondly, it was, it's not, uh, Jeremiah is saying, it's not an either or proposition. When you go there, I don't want you to either fall into one of two camps, that you assimilate into being a Babylonian on one hand, or that you stay so separate from them that you have no impact in the culture. That's why he says, build houses, settle down. And he gives them all those practical ways to go about continuing to live, right? You just keep living there. He goes, but I'm looking for you to find some middle ground. You're not there to become Babylonians, but I want, to put you, I want you to put down roots because you're going to be there for a while. And, and I want you to raise your families there. So it's, in essence, Jeremiah saying that God's saying, I don't want you to just love me, but hate the culture. Right? That's what religion does. Religion says, I love God, but hates all the sinful stuff in the, I mean, hates the sinners in the culture, right? Not just the sinful stuff, but hates the sinners too. So, ooh, we've got to be away from those people, Right? And, nor, nor, and God says, nor do I want you to love the culture and then forget me. That's what the secularists do, right? They, they don't believe in God or think of God, and they just love the way the culture is rolling. God comes along here and says to Jeremiah to say to these people in exile, I want you to love both. This is what followers of mine do. 
So you're not going to either, it's not an either or proposition, right? And then thirdly, he says God is calling the people to be spiritually by culture. You know, when he says there, pray for the city, seek the peace of the city, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I don't just want you to go there and build a little fortress community and lock out all the bad. You have an active role both physically and spiritually in this place that I've sent you to lose cultural power in. I uh, just grabbed this one this morning. I, it's not in the slide, so I'm going to read it to you. Can you imagine this? I'm standing here holding the Word of God, and I'm going to read to it from my Bible to you. <clears throat> Somehow that makes me feel more spiritual this morning. But it isn't. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writes... I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. You hear that? For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We engage the culture that is going in a completely different value quadrant than our own through prayer. That we might still find in our ability to live peaceful, quiet, godly, holy lives. But we care about them, right? And, and this is uh, God's way of uh, saying, love the city of man for the sake of the kingdom of God, I think. Uh, you got to live in both. I, 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 you know, like Daniel, you're going to have two names, as it were. Like Paul, he was what? A citizen of the kingdom of God. He said it very clearly in Philippians chapter 3. But he also what? Declared his what? His citizenship as a Roman. All the time, didn't he? He used it to advance the kingdom of God. So, in order, I want you to see this, because this is, this is a little bit, this is surprising, really. In order for Daniel to be in the position he was in, to even interpret the dream, he had to be one of those guys. Because it says in Daniel chapter 2, the decree was issued to put the wise men to death because they said, we can't do this thing you're asking, king. We can't tell you what you dreamed. And so men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Daniel's friends are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, whom we know as and their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, Daniel and his friends were working and living at the highest levels in a pagan culture, and they were doing it distinctively as followers of the God, of the Bible. Now, you think that was easy? No. In fact, you're going to run into these encounters, and next week we're going to look at what happens, because King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't quite get what Daniel tried to tell him in this dream interpretation. But, um, and you're going to see an amazing uh, confrontation take place about these guys who are living in the Babylonian culture. And now, here, they put their foot down and say, no, we will not do this thing you've asked us to do. But they were certainly willing to be trained in the arts of the enchanters and the divinators as Jewish men who honored God. It is a delicate balance. And if, here's my point. If you never wrestle in our culture with the idea that you might be assimilated too deeply into the culture, if that's not a tension that you're walking with as you go around in life as a follower of Christ, you're most likely assimilated if you don't feel that tension. Jeremiah says, no, God is calling you and the culture needs people who are going to be salt within it. But he also says what? I carried you there. I've taken you out of power for your own sake and also for their sake. That's important to go to be in a place where you're outnumbered and outgunned is what Jeremiah says God is saying to us. We want power, don't we? Politically, we really long for it. So does everybody else. And God says, there are times I'm going to use you and you're going to be outnumbered and you're going to be outgunned and I still want you to be there. And on the other hand, 
if you're not rubbing shoulders with the culture in some positive way for God's kingdom, then you're most likely separated from that culture. And I think the point is we need the sexual, secular culture because it humbles us and thereby refines us to be God's servant in that place. And so often as we find, we need to be taken out of power. And this is the history of the church for the last 2,000 years. Christians have seldom advanced in power. They've always advanced in weakness. Did you know that? The church always grows under persecution. Seldom while it's in power. I want to share something I picked up from Tim Keller this week on this very topic. He said, Christianity is the religion of the cross, of suffering, humility, and loss. And when we trade it for power, and boy, do we do that in a heartbeat, right? It almost immediately goes to seed. We grow power-hungry believers and not suffering servants. Boy, that's a mouthful. Um, we're, we're doing a class on mere Christianity on Monday nights, reading C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And I, I saw that we had a DVD play the very first week that showed how C.S. Lewis converted. He's an atheist. And uh, one of his quotes was pulled up, and I went and looked at it this week. And this, is, this quote has been rolling around in my head for the last three weeks. And it's one for us to remember. Lewis writes, there are no ordinary people Interesting, huh? <laughs> You've never talked to a mere mortal. Now, nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life to ours is as the life of a gnat. They don't count, he says. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually, perpetually solemn, meaning, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. Every person I run into is made in the image of God. Therefore, oh, what if I blow it, right? Oh, I'm just going to be here quiet and solemn, right? I love what Lewis says. No, we must play. <laughs> I like that. We get to be Tigger. He says, but our merriment must be of the kind, and it is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between immortal people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. What's he saying? We don't interact with mortals. We interact, interact with immortals, either in a hideous eternal state or a glorious eternal state. So therefore, don't be flippant with them. Certainly don't act superior to them. And don't presume that you know everything about them. Powerful. So the way God revives us is he takes us out of power. And I believe that's what Christians do best. I really do. And I, I think history proves that out. And boy, is this a message for me. Because I am so tempted by power. I am so tempted for political windfall. And, and I realize that, you know what? That's all part of God's plan. I mean, I can be engaged in my culture. I can be political in my voting. I can do all that. But in the end, the outcomes belong to God. And God has his purposes for what he's doing, right? And my job is to what? Pray. And Paul says, pray for those in authority. And be light. Be salt in the midst of that. Uh, don't assimilate to it. And clearly, if you're going to love it, don't separate yourself from it. That's the meaning of the two names, biculturalism. Second thing, what's the meaning of the dream? Well, here's an interesting question. Why would Nebuchadnezzar want to kill his smartest guys? And I think, you know, it's a fair question. What would drive him to wipe out this entire class of people that's in his inner court? Because I think this dream unsettled him greatly, right? 
and he really wanted to understand why he had this dream. And when we get to Daniel 3 next week, we're going to see the reason because in Daniel 3, he's had, I think, in his mind prior to this dream in Daniel 2, this great plan to build a statue of himself and have everybody worship him, create his own idol, as it were. And I think it's something he's always wanted. And here's the single most powerful person in the world in the 6th century B.C. and probably one of the 10 most powerful people who have ever attained that kind of power in the history of the world. And this dream comes and says to him, your statue has feet of clay. And I think he's scared about what this dream might mean for him because he's thinking about building this very statue, as it were. And what God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, I think he says to all of us in this dream, if you're building a sense of personal greatness on anything other than me, you're going to be thwarted. It's going to be destroyed. Popularity and fame won't last. If you build your life on money, you'll never take it with you. If you build your life on looks, and oh, do I know this one, you'll be scared by what's happening in the mirror. I've never understood why anybody over 60 wants a mirror in their house anyway. <laughs> Unless you wear ties, I guess. And this happens in Daniel chapter 4. It catches up to Nebuchadnezzar finally in a second dream, in a second reality that comes upon him. It's great bedtime reading. But whatever you build your life on, he says, they are feet of clay. That's what's coming out of the, the meaning of this dream. God says, if it's not me, it's fragile and it's going away. So if you have a dream of your own kingdom, you know, God says, I'm going to bring it down. So God gives this dream to the most powerful man on earth, and Daniel interprets it. We didn't read this portion, so I'll read this for you. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. Daniel's going to relay the interpretation to him here, right? He says, um, you're the God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed. Listen to this that, that God's done for Nebuchadnezzar. He has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar hearing that? Whoo! God really likes me. Right? And, and after you, he says, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. You bet. Right? Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for as iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all nations. But there's nothing in there that tells him what? That you're going to crumble and fall. Not in this dream, is it? And what that really is, this is one of the, Daniel is a book of tremendous prophecy, and um, it, it, we would have to just, isolate the prophetic teaching of Daniel unto its own series, which we may do here in the near future. But what he's talking about here is he's talking about the Babylonians as the first kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom that comes after his, the Greek kingdom under Alexander, and ultimately the Roman kingdom. Here's Daniel prophesying all this in 6th century B.C. And then he says these words. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all the other kingdoms and bring them to the end, but it itself, in and of itself will endure forever. So God's going to set up his own kingdom that will never be destroyed. And all these others are going to be swept away like chaff in a summer wind. And I want you to look at this. He's telling this story. I'll get more into this passage in a moment. But we're being told the main difference between who you and I are as followers of Christ and the secular culture that we live in is what? Our foundation. Is your foundation clay and iron mixed on the feet of this great statue, as so to speak, this imagery that we're given? Or is it in something that will last forever? So whose kingdom are you building? Whose glory do you work for? We all have a foundation in something for what we do. And it's our motivation that sets the course for what we do in life. You know, why am I doing what I do in life? Who and what kingdom am I serving? Is it mine? Because hear this, and we're all guilty of this. Even as believers and followers of Christ, we are, we are constantly in this temptation to serve two kingdoms. Because that's what the flesh does. That's why Jesus said 
He goes, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. The practical point is you have to ask yourself, what is the reason you're doing what you're doing? You know, these are great questions, and this is why you're here in Community of Faith, we're together in a church. To hear these questions asked of us, because you're not going to hear them asked anywhere else, is God sovereign over your life? And to the extent that he isn't, what is this dream telling us? You will be obliterated, or that part of you will be obliterated. It's not going to last. All those pursuits... You know, Noah talked about it last week in the, uh, talking about his surfboard adventure, right? That's where his passion, time, and treasure was. Get the surfboards out if the house burns. First thing, right? <laughs> That's what we're talking about here is do you take that inventory? How far are you assimilated into culture? But on the other hand, what? Don't live if you think you've got it together and you've got the truth in such a way that you don't engage that culture, that you don't recognize that it's not mere mortals you're interacting with, but that God has placed you there in humility to what? Make a difference. Be salt and light, right? So thirdly, last point, what is the meaning of the rock? In verse 35 it says, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The rock which goes in, grows into a mountain is clearly the kingdom of God, the one that lasts forever. And it says in there, it was a rock that was cut out, but not by human hands. It actually says that twice in, in the narrative. This is the imagery of a supernatural action, right? It's not the product of some human ingenuity that these other kingdoms were. This is the supernatural revelation of something God's doing. So the kingdom of God, we learned two things here, is, is, is a completely supernatural thing. It has nothing to do with us. It's all God-driven. And we also learned something else that's fascinating, the rock grows. The kingdom of God is a growing thing. And this is an important imagery in this dream. You know, it's a small rock, not cut with human hands. It's divinely driven. It enters into the scene, and during the time of these great earthly kingdoms is when it arrives. Can we imagine when that might be? Somewhere in early 0 AD or 2 or 3 BC, Bethlehem, something happens, right? And it's this small thing, starts out very small, doesn't it, that ultimately crushes the world system and gradually, gradually grows into a mountain that fills the whole world. Daniel is saying that what this rock means is that God's kingdom isn't going to be completed in a moment. He just wants to teach us that all earthly kingdoms are fleeting and only one kingdom is eternal. And I think it's important to understand if you're going to live in a secular culture that God's kingdom is a growing thing. It's a gradual thing, as it were. It, it doesn't come in suddenly and wipe out everything that's wrong, does it? No, we know that. That's why people don't believe in God. Oh, yeah, you Christians hang on to your thing. We see the world as it always has been, right? But the kingdom of God comes in two stages. It came when Jesus first came. But how did it come? In weakness and service. How are we called to live? In weakness and service. And it didn't wipe away all the evil in the world when he came, did it? But then, Jesus returns. And the kingdom of God, we know, will come in total power and fill the whole earth. In fact, when it's all done, he's going to destroy this earth and heaven itself, and recreate a new heaven and a new earth. Are you familiar with that yes. concept? Amazing. We're going to live on a planet again in eternity. And the kingdom of God is here, but it's not yet finished. So it's important, I think, for Christians to live in a secular, pluralistic society because God has planned it, ordained it this way. And let me tell you this, and on one hand... And this should be so encouraging for us. It's, there's a terrific certainty to what I'm talking about because there's, there's this truth of, of God's kingdom. You know, God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It itself will endure forever. I'll tell you what. I've staked my claim in life on that truth. This is the hill I will die on because I believe it. 
But on the other hand, it's not yet finished. You and I are working out this amazing truth and the faith in this amazing truth in a broken place, in a broken culture, just like every other Christian has in the last 2,000 years. And if you're ever going to be able to work out how to live distinctively in a secular culture as a believer in Christ, in the midst of a broken world, you can't do that unless you're doing two things, I think, deeply immersed in God's word in some way. And the obvious way is to read it, right? But sometimes some of us don't work that way well. So we got to be deeply immersed. And that's why the life of some church has to be a part of your life. Not a consumer guy that goes from one church to the next church to the next church, but somebody that moves in and says, you know what, these are fellow believers who believe about the kingdom of God like I believe about the kingdom of God, that understand how I entered into the kingdom of God was by the grace of God. And I'm going to share that life with others because I need that in order to live this distinct life. You can't live in both places without either assimilating or separating unless you have a balance of fellow believers. You know, this church is run, as it were, by four pastors. They're the leaders here. I thank God every week that I have never been a senior pastor. Because I can assure you, had I been, you would be dealing with the Peter principle at Sierra Community Church. How did that guy <laughs> get in charge? Every week, not so much something I say anymore, because I've gotten smart to not let it out. <laughs> but I hear other things, and I go, oh, man, I'm glad I kept my mouth shut. Because that's far greater wisdom than I possess. Because why? It's the best shot we got to get it together is to have a multiplicity of leaders to do that. So you need the church. This is where real life transformation takes place. I say this to people all the time that I can tell are new to church or are all new to this whole thing about, wow, this is a whole paradigm shift on how I see the world and how I see life coming to Christ. It's an upside down version of how I used to live my life. And I say to them, don't stop coming to church. You know, they do this in the 12-step program. Come back, come back, come back. You want to stay sober? Keep coming back. You want to transform life? Don't let your mind be left alone. Because I'll tell you what, the mind is a terrible thing. Oh, yeah. That comes from Pastor Rex. <laughs> and here's the other side of this, what I'm trying to tell you. And why consumer Christians exist. No church has completely arrived. Right? That's why people bounce around. Wow, I like this teacher over here. Or I like this or that. Right? There's no ultimate denomination. And contrary to what a lot of people think, there nobody has all their teachings right. Nobody. I am fully prepared to meet Jesus and have my theology corrected on many levels of how I might have missed something. There are no ultimate human interpretations of God's truth. And what's the Bible do, the New Testament in particular? It pounds us with the gospel. It says, here's the simple truth of why you are eternal in heaven with me by the basis of what my son has done for you. So what this means is we have to believe other Christians and other churches, maybe we would never darken the door of that church because we think they're so different, right, are doing God's work as well. But here's the other thing. This is what makes it so difficult to be salt and light. Some con congregations clearly assimilate into culture, clearly walk away from the teachings of God in a way that you can just see it black and white, right? Other congregations separate themselves so far from culture, keep them away, right? They're of no value to the place that God has put them in. In their humility, they fortress. So here's what we do at Sierra. This is, not, this is a, a no-brainer. We're not perfect. We know it. But I'll tell you what. We try to give God our ear and do our best to listen to him. So the gospel is you're saved. You're really 
saved, right? There is a truth, there is a certain truth that we can hang on to. And therefore, there are some things I can, I can insist on, right, about what it means to follow Christ. But remember, we're all sinners. And we're saved, what? Strictly by the grace of God and what he's done in our life. Therefore, when people oppose you, and this whole thing about what C.S. Lewis says, right? Don't be flippant. Don't be presumptuous, right? Um, don't be superior to people. Well, that's so important because you don't know if they're better than you or not, you know? I meet so many people that don't know Christ that are living in a secular mindset that are more kind than I am, that are more compassionate than I am, that are more patient than I am. None of them are funnier than me. <laughs> So we have to hold in this whole idea is there's no reason why just because we're a follower of Christ and they're not that somehow we're better than them. We are definitely more blessed. You're a sinner saved by grace. And the reason you're saved and they're not has nothing to do with you being a better person, does it? No. That's why we don't have a superiority complex. But what the gospel does is it gives you a resource for loving others in this culture without being one who assimilates completely into the culture and has no boundaries, as it were, and just embraces secular life, nor do we have a separatist attitude. You know, religious people are certain, but they don't have any flexibility. Secular people have no certainty because they don't believe in truth, right? And they have this tremendous flexibility. They can just think and do whatever they want, the religious people go, oh, I have truth, I'm certain. But they have no flexibility, right? To live a life of Daniel, to live a life of engagement for the sake of the culture, to have this distinctness that somehow you can be both uh, in the culture but have integrity before God, requires that we have to love others and know our own foundation and understand that the kingdom of God is here in my heart but it's not here yet in their hearts. we, we got to be like Abraham, who the author of Hebrews writes, was looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. That's how we live our lives. And you look to Jesus, right? It says that in, in Hebrews as well. Look to Christ. And, and the interesting thing is, in this message, he's the fulfillment of all these points of mine. He has two names, right? He's God and man, because he's in the world, but he's also from heaven. He's the real son of God that became flesh and blood, a real human being. And, of course, he's the ultimate dazzling figure, right? He, he's the one, only one that's golden from top to bottom. There is no feet of clay in Christ. And he's the only one, really, really, that we can bow down and worship. And, of course, Jesus Christ is the rock. You know, in Luke, which we just finished, in Luke chapter 20, is one of my... There's so many favorite verses, but this is one of them. He is the stone the builders rejected, but he has now become the cornerstone. Right? And then in verse 18, he says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken. You know who those people are? That's you and me. When we come to Christ, we fall on that rock, and it breaks us. We recognize who we are and what we are. We're sinners. But listen what he says at the end of that verse, Luke 20, 18. But the person on whom that rock falls will be crushed. That's what Daniel's telling Nebuchadnezzar in this dream. And if you understand Jesus that way, I think you and I can both live a life of Daniel. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, this is really, uh, this series is going to be really about how then shall we live in the midst of uh, all the craziness and holding on to you. And I just pray that in the ways that we've examined this morning our own heart, um, that we would embrace humility before you and that we would go out, as the prophet Micah said, and attempt to live rightly, do justice as it were. 
And Father, uh, may we always have you ever before us in that journey. May we see others as immortals. And maybe in our humility, discover how to be salt and light and to love on them. Certainly that will bring you glory, this I know. Certainly, may we pray for that, Lord, to that end. May we not wag our fingers and denigrate, but rather pray for people that are lost. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, two things before we close in a worship song. There's a discussion group upstairs, as you know, after this for the message. If you want to sit down and talk about what I've talked about. And then 401 signups are in the back. Don't forget that as we go. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week.